We are in Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2. Seems strange, doesn't it? Um, Christmas, just, I know it was a, uh, just a week or so ago, and yet it seems like months. Until I turn the corner in the house and see the Christmas tree still up. <laughs> Romans chapter 2, we are looking this morning at, uh, so who is the judge? What is the standard? Who should be a judge? Romans chapter 2, we are going to be looking into verses 1 through 5. Therefore, you are without excuse, whoever you are, when you judge someone else. For on whatever grounds you judge another person, you condemn yourself. Because you who judge practice the same things. Now we know that God's judgment is in accordance with truth against those who practice such things. And, and do you think whoever you are when you judge those who practice such things and yet you do them yourself, that you will escape God's judgment? Or do you have the contempt for the wealth of his kindness, forbearance and patience and yet do not know that God's kindness leads to repentance. But because of your stubbornness and your unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath for yourselves in the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment is revealed. We are looking this morning at um, continuing to expand on the idea of, of God's judgment, God's anger, um, what is God going to hold us all accountable for? I would call your attention that in just these five verses, the word judgment um, or a word closely related to it is mentioned eight times. This is very crucial to our understanding of what, what is the message that Paul is attempting to bring at this point. Now, if, as we look at the Baptist faith and message, and, and what's so crucial this morning is uh, having a orthodox, a correct foundation for what we believe. Uh, the London Confession, which is what we base our Baptist heritage upon, the fall of man, point four, from the original corruption whereby we are utterly indisposed, disabled, and made opposite of all good and wholly inclined to all evil, do precede all actual transgressions. As uh, people of faith, we come to scriptures and we say, from the fall, we do not have the capability of pleasing God. We can't be good enough. We don't have some sort of a faith that says, if I just come often enough, if I say the right prayers, um, go through the right catechism, I don't need Jesus. Paul is making the point, and this is our Baptist heritage, we are under God's wrath without Jesus. We are completely fallen. Um, the Baptist faith and message for the Southern Baptist Convention in section three about man Therefore, as soon as they are capable of moral action, they become transgressor, uh, transgressors and are under condemnation. Only the grace of God can bring man into his holy fellowship and enable man to fulfill the creative purposes of God. Well, these uh, verses I, I found this week to be so important. Th this is the very foundation of what we believe. It, it reminded me of the house I used to live in. Uh, the house that I used to live in in the Bay Area, uh, that particular subdivision, when the houses were built uh, in the late, uh, in the mid 40s, um, there wasn't a garage. Um, there was apparently just the house, and that was the way they were kind of built. And throughout the years, of course, people added on. Most of the people would kind of attach the garage to the house, and you might think that's the way that it was. But originally, none of them had garages. None of them had anything. It was just the house. And then people started adding on. Now, the house where I lived, uh, apparently at one point, someone added on like a 10 by 8 or 10 by 12 kind of shed work area. And it had a foundation. And it had a smooth cement floor. And, and then at some other point, 
um, someone just poured concrete and didn't even smooth it out. It was still had the, the rough kind of small pebbles in it. And they just put up walls kind of right on that slab of concrete. So there were two different foundations. Well, actually there was a third. Uh, because this house was right behind what was a creek and then when it flooded in the late 50s, that was all cemented in. Um, we actually, that property actually expanded and that dirt got kind of smoothed out in the backyard. Well, that raised the backyard up about six inches. And that covered the top of the foundation for the back of the garage. Now, over the 70 years, that dirt and rain and moisture totally rotted out whatever attachment there was to the back of the garage's foundation. So as it turned out, two walls had what you would call a normal foundation. But parts of those two walls were just somehow attached to slab. And the back of the garage really wasn't attached to anything. And, and you could kind of move the whole structure. <coughs> well, I decided to change it from a work area into a, like an office. And we began to see this is going to be a problem because we have to correct this. And as they were working on it and they exposed that foundation, they said, you can't, you can't go forward till you change this foundation, replace all this rotted wood, and actually put something there. This brings us to a crucial understanding of where we are in our faith with Jesus. You have to have the correct foundation or whatever you put on it is either going to be a waste of time or incorrectly applied or what you're building on the foundation is, is not going to last. And so we are looking at Paul's argument here. He began in chapter one of explaining that God's wrath is against people who well, don't believe in him. God's wrath is, we would say, obviously going to be displayed against people who live a lifestyle of rebellion and wanton sin. And we would agree with that. We would say that, um, well, people, as Paul explained in chapter one, who have an incorrect idea about God or who don't even believe in God to begin with anyway, aren't going to be constrained by his precepts, his laws, his instructions. And because they don't recognize God's character and position and authority, they begin to erect their own ideas as to how they should live. And more often than not, they reject his commands and in fact do the very things that they know God disapproves. They begin to live a lifestyle that invariably completely goes against revealed instructions from the Almighty. And Paul made the argument, you can look at nature and you would have to be able to conclude something made this. There is exquisite harmony and structure in all of nature and we should be led to think there is a God and I need to obey the instructions of, those God, of that God. But we instead have baseless expectations. In our fallen nature, we begin to think that I have a right to pursue just pleasure. I should have the ability to seek whatever gives me the greatest amount of pleasure and joy. Or we have those heretics such as Joel Olstein who says, really, the whole purpose of God's relationship with you is he just wants to bless you. If you have enough faith, well, God wants to give you better cars and a better house and you want to be healthier, but that all is based on your faith with the Almighty. And if you don't have faith, well, that's why you don't have a better car. And if you don't have faith, well, that's why you have the health issues that you do. All of this, Paul says in the latter parts of chapter one, come from corrupted reasoning. Your thinking process is chaotic. It doesn't have a purpose. And so as we attempt to, to make sense of the world around us, we come up with faulty ideas. We come up with faulty reasoning as to what's going to correct our basic problem. We come up with schemes as to how we're going to solve the issues facing humanity or our community. 
And as we could see, if we look around at the political nature of, of even the state of California, our ability to solve our own problems is non-existent. Our attempts are just usually going to make things worse. Now, we would all probably agree with that. People who have a lifestyle of wanton rebellion, people who engage in behavior that we would say, you know that's not right. You know that's destructive. You, you can't have a lifestyle where you just live on the street doing drugs. And we would say, you know that's wrong. And, and most people would say, yes, that's not good for society. Now, Paul in chapter 2 is going to take another trajectory here. He's going to move the argument up another whole level. And what he's going to do is explain how this impacts everyone, not just those who are living a lifestyle of wanton rebellion. Now, I would say just in starting out, many different experts have different ideas as to what we do with chapter 2. Your translation probably starts out with something like, therefore, or because of this, or now. Um, and as you might have heard many people say, when you see a therefore, you want to know what it's there for. Well, that's the question. They, they can't agree, the experts, the scholars, on is Paul referring all the way back to verse 18 or something more recent? And is this person Jewish or Gentile or a combination of both? Who is this new person? If, if you could read the original Greek, you would see that chapter 1 is all about they, who these people are that rebel against God. But chapter 2 begins with a very emphatic you. So there is a very significant change here. And the many different commentators and scholars can't seem to agree, well, who is the you? And, and what is Paul making the, the change from what to the next topic? If we were to look at this, and I don't want to spend a whole lot of time talking academics, it seems that Paul is now advancing to the next level of his reasoning. He is writing to the Church of Rome to make sure that as your church is growing, you want to be on the correct foundation. You want to have an orthodox understanding of who Jesus is. This church at Rome has not had an apostle come and instruct them. So as Paul is making plans to come there, he wants to make sure your church is growing. Make sure that it's growing on the right foundation. And so chapter 2 begins with a very convicting, a very important, and I hope this morning as I am able through the power of the Holy Spirit to touch on many of these crucial ideas as to Paul moves his argument to the next level. We have been looking at, as one of the commentators, Doug Moose said, uh, there are probably people in the church would be, would be shouting amen from chapter 1. People who live in open rebellion are going to be judged by God. And you could almost hear people going, amen, preach it, that's true. You, you can't expect to live a lifestyle of wanton uh, sexual lascivity and expect not to have God's judgment. And we might have people going, amen, preach it. Well, now we get to chapter 2. And Paul is making a very awkward next step in his presentation of the correct gospel. And remember, Paul is making the case, who needs to have Jesus and who Jesus really is? And so he begins in chapter 2. Therefore, you are without excuse, whoever you are, when you judge someone else. For on whatever grounds you judge another person, you condemn yourself because you who judge practice the same things. Now, if we could imagine the audience that Paul might be addressing, maybe they were converted Gentiles, but maybe Paul is addressing people that are just good people. He might be addressing people who go to synagogue on a regular basis, good Jewish person. Now, Paul is going to address good Jewish people in verse 17, but at this point, Paul appears to be addressing people who are good people, moral people, people who we would say, we want these people in our church. They make good decisions. They have a very stable lifestyle. They have raised their kids in a very orderly manner. 
Um, and they, they certainly stand against the corruption that we see in our society. And yet Paul says, you know, if you're judging anything, when you judge other people, when you judge the drag queen story hour at the library, you're exposing yourself to the same judgment. Now, I'm sure some of the people who heard this, maybe that good Jewish person in the back row would lean to his Gentile friend and say, you know, he's talking about you because we have the law. But really, Paul is including both of them. By acknowledging that there is a standard and by acknowledging this is a violation of that standard, you are affirming you know that God has a standard. It's not a sliding scale. And when we make a statement, and of course most of us have, about different types of lifestyles, about drag queen story hour, about uh, the gay mirage marriages, whatever else is going on in our society, we are stating, perhaps unaware, we acknowledge that there's a standard and we more than likely, in many ways, are violating that very standard ourselves. Even though they are excessively obvious violations of God's standards, chapter one, which most normal people would say those are bad for society. You, you can't live in a community where you have someone who's grossly taking advantage of other people. We would say that's wrong. We want there to be order and structure. It's hard for us to perhaps grasp that there is a standard that not only applies to those people in chapter one, but applies to us. The very things we do. Because it's not a matter of degrees, it's a matter of exactness. We would prefer there to be a sliding scale, a sliding scale where we would say, well, you know, I may have my issues, but I am nothing like that. I may struggle in some area, but I'm really way ahead of the curve. I'm not like most people. Years ago when I was working in the psych hospital, I got to tell you, I loved going to the group meetings. I would go to those group meetings and you would hear people share their experiences and they were unbelievable. You would think, wait, wait a minute, you went to, you, you went to the bar and you did what? Well, I mean, I got problems at home, but they're nothing like that. I'm actually doing pretty good. We, we would want a, a, a relationship with God like that, where we could come and say, you know, um, I may have some issues, but I'm not like all of these people. I'm way ahead of them. I'm not like those people at all. It, it's very much like the parable of the, the Pharisee and the tax gatherer, where the Pharisee goes into the temple and looks at the tax gatherer and says, well, look at this. I am so much better than that filthy tax gatherer. I tie 10% of everything. I obey the law. I'm really not a bad person. Now, if we could be honest, most of us are going to be on that sliding scale. And if we ask you, why do you think you're going to avoid God's wrath? Because that's how Paul started out, verse 18 in chapter 1. The wrath of God is revealed against everyone. And you would say, well, not me. That's not particularly mad at me because... Well, I go to church on a regular basis. I'm actually a, not a bad person. I mow my lawn on a regular basis. I, I try to be generous with my resources. I'm not like all these other people. Now, that's what we would like to believe. What we don't want to believe is Matthew chapter 5, verse 21, the Sermon on the Mount. Um, we find that very awkward. Well, yeah, I know that you shall not commit murder, but really, verse 21, if, if I make a statement of anger against somebody, that's, that's kind of equal to murder? Well, sometimes when I'm driving down to come to church, people cut me off. <laughs> Sometimes when people are getting on the freeway, they don't hit the gas. 
and, and, and they're not going as fast as I want. I call them Biden voters. Um, do I really believe that God's going to hold me accountable for that anger? Because that's what chapter 5, verse 21 says. And when I rail, and, and I'll be honest, I listen to some of those radio stations, and it's so easy to go down the political road where you start railing against political parties and, and how, how we can be so angry with Joe Biden and whatever. And then we see chapter 5, verse 27. Wait a minute. Um, you're so easy to get agitated about people who aren't behaving themselves sexually as you would like, and you can make comments about drag sting cordia. Um, have you ever looked at a woman with lust in your heart? Because that's the same thing as the actual deed. Well, that puts it on a whole different level. So the problem isn't that people just need to help themselves get higher up on the scale. The problem is we're all on the same scale. We're on the same scale because we do things that we want to believe are on a different level, but they're not. We want to engage in what we know is rebellious behavior, but it's not as bad as the rebellious behavior that other people do. And I really don't want to have to admit that my thought process is equally as bad as actually doing something? Well, Paul explains in verse 2, don't be confused. Don't overlook this idea. Now we know that God's judgment is in accordance with truth against those who practice such things. You can play whatever game you want, you can try to believe in this sliding scale of acceptability. But there should come a point when you have to agree, you know, God is going to judge according to his eternal truth. Not according to the latest opinion poll. Not according to what you think is acceptable. We're all going to be held accountable to God's truth. God's absolute truth. Now that's the standard. Well, that changes everything. I'm not held accountable just to what most people do. I'm not held accountable to just what's acceptable in this church. Oh, I'm held accountable to God's standards, regardless of what people do around me. And then Paul asked two revealing questions. These questions reminded me of um, sometimes when my wife and I are going out. And she'll look at me and she'll say, <laughs> you're not wearing that shirt, are you? you? You can't wear that shirt. Th these aren't questions for discussion. These are questions that are obvious. Well, no, you can't. You need to go change. Question number one in verse three, um, do you think, whoever you are that's judging, do you think, really, those who practice such things and yet you do them yourself, that you will escape God's judgment? First question, do you, do you really think God's not going to hold you accountable just because you happen to be at a different place on this sliding scale? Well, verse 2 says no. Verse 2 says God has an absolute standard, and guess what? None of us make it. And you are sadly deluding yourself. You're fooling yourself. If you think, because you're on a different part of that scale, that that means you're not guilty. Do you think, really, you're going to escape God's judgment because you just do it a little bit cleaner? Because you do the same thing a little bit more acceptably? Because maybe you don't look at the pornography on your computer till late at night when it's dark and everyone's in bed? You, you don't do it in broad daylight, so that makes it different? Paul's question is obvious. If, if you are involved in this, you know God is going to hold you to an exact standard. Don't, don't try to fool yourself. And then the next question. Not only do I think God will not hold me accountable because, well, I do many good works. 
maybe I'm deluding myself, I'm fooling myself by thinking, well, there is this kind of sliding balance in heaven, and if I do more good works than bad works, it's... Chapter 2, verse 3 says, if I do these things, I need to be very certain God will hold me accountable to his absolute standard. And the next big question, do you really think, do you really think that God is so loving, so merciful, so compassionate, and he is, that he's not going to hold you accountable for this? He's going to put up with it? Now, this is, this is the reality for many churches in America today. It, it's kind of a reality for our, our culture right now. You, you need to accept everyone's statement of what they believe. You're supposed to be accepting, and, and we want everyone to come to our church, even if they don't change their behavior, even if they're involved in obvious sin, if they make some sort of a statement about who Jesus is. In my classroom, I had an interaction with a particular young man who was wearing a T-shirt that said, Jesus loves everyone. Well, I wanted to have a little bit of fun. And, and I know on one level that's true, but I asked the man, really? I asked this young man, really? Jesus loves everyone. The Pharisees who didn't accept him? Well, um, he still loved them even though they didn't accept him. Mm -hmm. Jesus loves everyone, even those who reject him? Oh, yes. Well, if his love is so great, how can his love not be greater than their rejection? Is everybody saved? Well, well, no. We, and I would probably guess, there are those among us who are a little bit fuzzy on that ourselves. Yes, Jesus loves everyone. He went to the cross and he died for our sins. But verse 2 says there is a judgment coming and we are held to God's exact standards. There will be a judgment. We will be held to a standard. Verse 4 says you're not going to avoid that. Do you think that somehow God is going to put up with your sins? Your open rebellion just because he's merciful and compassionate and kind? Just because it's not as bad as the others? Do you really think that your relationship with God is just that he wants to bless you and he doesn't want to hold you accountable? Verse 5, but because of your stubbornness, and your unrepentant heart, you're storing up wrath for yourself in the day of wrath when God's judgment is revealed. God's patience with you is not because he's putting up with it. God's delay of judgment with you is not because he finds it acceptable. God's delay of his wrath in your life is not because, well, he just loves you so much that he's willing to to accept any kind of behavior on your part. God has been waiting for you to realize the error of your way and for you to be repentant. Be very clear about that. God hasn't been tolerating your sin because it's not as bad as others. God hasn't been tolerating your hypocrisy because, well, you do many good works. He's been tolerating your blatant hypocrisy because he wants you to repent and he's given you time to do that. Amen. Don't be confused. The wrath of God will be revealed against all hypocrites, people who claim to be able to judge others but do the same thing themselves. And if he hasn't been judging you in your life, he will because he's only been giving you time to repent. Now, as we conclude this morning, there are some really big lessons. We in America, we here in California, probably in most churches, have this odd idea that the more people appear to be nice people, the more I should be accepting of them. 
the more people look prosperous and successful and they're clean and they're moral people. I can count on them to make morally good decisions. Well, we want those kind of people in our church. Those are the kind of people we want to put on committees. Um, I, I say with great embarrassment, this, this would be illustrated by my own father. In his later years, he was doing electrical contracting against the union rules, and he was coming up with some huge contracts. Well, it was because he was giving a kickback to the general superintendent, but he had it all worked out where he was giving 10% to the church. And when you start talking about walking into a church and giving the church $20,000, $10,000, uh, with great embarrassment, I'm going to tell you, he became very close to many ministers. He was their friend. They would go out to lunch with him. Uh, they were impressed with what he was doing. They were impressed with his money. Um, you know, here's a problem. It, it doesn't matter how much money somebody has. It, it doesn't matter what kind of a car they drive. It doesn't matter how they vote. It doesn't matter what political party they endorse. The best of people need Jesus. The best of people need Jesus. We often are colonially off track and we think it's the worst. Yes, street druggies need Jesus. Yes, people that are involved in crime need Jesus. But the best person you can think of, the most moral person you can think of, they need Jesus too. There is no escaping the need for Jesus because you can't be good enough. You can't do enough works. You can't have the right position on the sliding scale of sin to say, I've reached the point where I don't need Jesus. You're being a hypocrite. Another very important point this morning, there are many good people. There are many good people in church, people who donate money, people who donate their time, people who donate their expertise, people that you could call up on a moment's notice and say, hey, we got a leaky pipe. People that are willing to meet the needs in the congregation. I've been in churches like that, good people. We must never escape the truth. Good works does not save anybody. We, we are very comfortable around people that are successful. I'm very comfortable around people that seem to, to share my political ideas. I'm very comfortable about people that aren't, well, needy, that don't appear to be living a lifestyle of sin. Paul wants us to be very clear. None of that makes any difference. The best of people need Jesus. And doing fabulous good works doesn't get you into heaven. Now, this is where we have a real need to be clear in what our church does. If we were to ask so many churches today, if we were to ask perhaps people in, among us this morning, what should your church be doing? Well, we need to be doing good works. You need to have a, a clothing closet for the community. You need to have a food pantry. You need to have outreach ministries. You need to be working with single mothers. Well, you know, those things are important. But none of those things save anybody. If the primary purpose of this church is not to proclaim Jesus as the one and only way to get into heaven, you're wasting your time. You're wasting your time. Yes, we do need to be concerned about needs in our community. Yes, we can run a food, a food pantry. Yes, we should be more concerned about helping single mothers. But our primary concern needs to be let me tell you about Jesus. And you know what's true in many churches, and I hope it's not true in this church, we need to be more concerned about testimony than we are about works. We need to be more concerned about a person's relationship with Jesus than about how much money they'd be putting in the plate. One of our first questions, and I know you, you really don't like me calling on you, <laughs> We should be comfortable to stand up and say, whatever else is going on, let me explain to you. Let me share with you what Jesus has done in my life. 
I'm appreciative for people who work in this church, but I should not be impressed with what a person does. I want to hear what has Jesus done in your life. And if you can tell me that you have gone from death and sin to living a life now with the Lord your Savior, I should be impressed with that. It doesn't matter what car you drive. That needs to be the primary decision point on who I put on a committee. Hey, I've grown up in Baptist churches, Melrose Baptist Church. I knew who was going to be on a committee. Any committee. I could tell you who was going to be on a committee. It was the guy who owned a car lot. It was the person or several people who had very successful businesses. It was a CPA. It was people whose parents had founded the church. I never once had any of those people stand up in front of the church and say, let me share with you what Jesus has done to me. And this is why we want that man on our committee. I never heard that once. You know, if this church is going to really be a kingdom church, we are people who respond to a person's testimony and not what they can do. We are it's going to be someone who responds to the witness and not to their position. We're going to be the person who, uh, we want to see the person who evidences the salvation in their life and not what they can do to help us out. Who is the judge? Well, we have an eternal judge who's going to hold us all accountable, and that is an absolute scale that none of us measures up to passing. None of us can pass. And we fool ourselves when we think we're better than anybody else. It's so easy to do. Oh, I'm better than those people on the street. Oh, I'm better than those liberal people down the street that have a church that's not in... Make it clear this morning, we are on a very exact scale and God will hold us accountable and none of us will pass. The best of us will not pass. We're so concerned with the worst. The best of us cannot pass God's scale. That's why we need Jesus. Paul is making the point this morning who needs Jesus? Well, chapter 1, the, the rebels do. The street druggies, those people involved in crime. Oh, those people in San Quentin. Yeah, they, they need Jesus. Paul's point this morning is the best person you can think of. They need Jesus. And it doesn't matter how better you become, more stable in your life, the more secure you become in your financial standing. That doesn't matter. You need Jesus. The best of people, the worst of people, our message should be the same. All have fallen short of God's glory. And as a church, we are here to present that clearly. We're not going to waste someone's time by saying you're good enough or we'll help you be good enough or we'll let you be involved in church events or church activities where you can think you're doing enough good works. We want to be very clear. None of us will be good enough. We want you to know about Jesus who makes us good enough. Now, if that's the focal point of our church, we can do a lot of things. But our primary focus as a church and as individuals needs to be, I can't be good enough. I can't do enough good works. I can't come here and think that, well, I've been here every Sunday this year. I'm doing pretty good. Our foundation for needing Jesus is the awareness, I will never be good enough. Even if I've had a good year. Even if I can drive home and I don't yell at anybody. <laughs> I'll never be good enough. And you don't need to ask my wife about this. No matter how good my week is gone, no matter how bad my week is gone, I need Jesus. As a church, as an individual, if that can be our focus, it's not about events, it's not about programs, it's not about doing community things. Those might be good, but my focus needs to be, I need Jesus. 
And everyone needs Jesus. And that's what I want this church to do. And the clearer we do that, the more we are preaching his kingdom and not getting sidetracked into waste of time. Can we be clear on that? The best of people need Jesus. Let's not be fooled by money. Let's not be fooled by possessions. Let's not be fooled by securities. Lack of security. Lack of housing. Whether they have a better house or not. We need Jesus. And the more we see each other as equally missing the mark the more we actually are worshiping the same way in the same person and the more we have a good foundation. Nobody here is better than me. Nobody here is better than me. I need Jesus. No matter how many books I have in my library, no matter how many classes I've taken, no matter how much money I have in the bank, no matter what kind of car I drive, none of that matters. I could be better than anybody in the community. None of that matters. I still need Jesus. And if we can focus on that as a church and as individuals, the community will see this is a different place, a really different place. And people around you will be able to say, that's a different person. That's a really different person. They may be hypocrites, but they're honest about it, and they're depending on Jesus. Let's pray. Our Father, it's so easy to come uh, before your throne and be guilty of this and thinking that we're better than others and thinking that somehow we've arrived at a better position in life. It's so easy to think that if we just had a little bit more financial security, a little bit better health, a little bit... um, a little bit more consistency in our lifestyle that we would actually be better. Please help us to be aware this morning through the power of your spirit that the only thing that makes us better is your indwelling spirit and the death of Jesus visible in our life. We pray that that would be evident in everyone here and we pray that that would be evident in this church. For your honor and glory, we pray these things. Amen.